And welcome to the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association of Australia Facebook Live broadcast for Thursday morning, 10 a.m. on the 17th of September. Uh, we normally broadcast these sessions uh, at around about seven o'clock at night, but today we have an extra special uh, episode in which we have brought together pilots, aircraft owners, aviation professionals and student pilots from right across the world to talk about a really important subject. And that subject is youth engagement, how we get young people involved in aviation and excited to be part of aviation, uh, living and working in this new digital world. And so without wasting too much time, I'm going to bring our guests straight in. Uh, and I'm just going to quickly go around the room here. I'm going to do some very quick introductions. We're going to start with Mike Glynn. Mike uh, is a fellow Australian aviator. He's a former RAAF uh, Caribou pilot and Qantas uh, captain, has recently retired uh, and has also been an avid uh, flight simulation enthusiast. Uh, welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks very much, Ben. We've got Shane Jones uh, all the way over in Western Australia. That's right. We do have a state on that side of the country. Shane, welcome. You're a student pilot and uh, hoping to one day get involved in commercial aviation yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ben. That's no problems. Now we're going to switch gears. We're doing the whole Brady Bunch thing. And uh, a special welcome to Frank uh, Polano Jr. from the United States. Uh, Frank is uh, has been an aircraft owner. He's uh, been a pilot. He's been involved with the military uh, and is a huge uh, virtual reality flight simulation advocate. Uh, welcome, Frank. Good day, Margo. Thanks for having me. Ben, <laughs> and, that. That's okay. And we've got, uh, again, a special, uh, a special welcome to Chris Curtis. Chris joins us from the US as well. Chris is a former military aviator and is currently a flight test engineer. Uh, and again, is also a VR flight simulation uh, enthusiast and also has been involved with uh, calling and uh, announcing air shows and working with some air show display teams. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Pleasure to be here. Appreciate it. No problems. And our lucky last is Nolan Cooney, all the way from Canada. Uh, Nolan is a, a private pilot and he's currently working for a airline over in uh, Canada, Air Inuit, uh, and is also a flight simulation enthusiast. Welcome, Nolan. Sorry, thanks for having me. Well, first thing that our AOPA members and industry supporters would notice is, wow, we've got people from across Australia and also right across the United States. What a what an eclectic mix, but we're going to be talking about a subject which will show that uh, there's actually a common thread that connects us all. And it really is around the, the, the central discussion point of getting people involved in aviation and encouraging young people to take part and inspiring them to pursue careers. And the discussion point for this panel um, broadcast is in fact virtual reality flight simulation technology. And that is the thread here. We're all involved uh, in flight simulation. Uh, and I guess the best place to start is to just talk a little bit about uh, what is flight simulation technology today. And it's certainly not the Microsoft flight simulator of 20 years ago that we possibly remember. And Mike, I'll probably throw the first question to you. Um, going back 10 15 years ago within the aviation industry if you kind of said that you had an involvement with flight simulator it it didn't necessarily have a good connotation to it did it no it uh microsoft flight simulator itself uh, was viewed as a game um a lot of uh, and a lot of to be fair a lot of the uh simulators are games but uh, i would uh tell people that uh, First thing I would do when I was uh, converting to a new type of aircraft would be to buy the the best uh, Microsoft Flight Sim uh, version of that aircraft I could fly, and it was a perfect way to get in, introduced to the uh, particular aircraft type and to practice uh, a lot of the skills that you would need to pass a, a sim um, program. And uh, basically. I really did get the impression I was a lone voice. Uh, there were one or two guys I flew with who who realised the potential of the uh, technology, but mostly not. I think that's changing. I think it's changing a lot. I have a friend of mine who was the former head of training and checking in Qantas, and I did approach him. I'd say, you, you really do need to get involved uh, with VR, um, have um, some sets that you can give uh, to guys uh, when they're uh, when they're converting to a new type, get them uh, it, um, to run through the systems and all that sort of thing. And he was very respons uh, responsive to that. 
Uh, so I think that's changing, but 15 years ago, no, that was it was, it was very different. 15, 20. Well, I can I can certainly remember Mike, uh, my first days out at Bankstown Airport in Sydney, uh, learning to fly, and the jokes that used to be passed by instructors who would lament, "Oh yes, I've had that student who comes through and." They tell them all about their flight simulation experience and instructors were a bit ambivalent as to whether that was actually helping them with those students or was actually counterproductive with those students. Uh, and things certainly have, have come a long way. So much so that in 2020, we as a global aviation industry have faced a crisis which absolutely nobody saw coming. Uh, COVID-19 really blindsided the global aviation industry and also military aviation. Uh, and has caused massive economic um, destruction uh, for many parts of the aviation industry, large, medium and small. Um, but something truly phenomenal has taken place during this period, which I never expected to be either part of or even to have seen. And that was all of these pilots and aviation professionals who were suddenly stuck at home, uh, there on um, quarantine or isolation and I know in Australia we had very strict isolation guidelines that were asking people to try and stay away from public places and I ended up working from home myself for quite a few months um, and through this process obviously people were looking for things to do and what we saw was people coming together online through flight simulation and so uh, the reason everybody is here in this panel uh, discussion today is that I met each and every one of you through a piece of software called Digital Combat Simulator or DCS, which is a flight simulation package, uh, which is built around a multiplayer uh, system. And that multiplayer system allows us to be in an environment where we can fly aircraft with each other and we can have conversations and we can talk. And so Frank, it's probably a great moment and time to pull you in because I probably uh, have gotten to know you, I, I think it's fair to say, I've gotten to know you quite well over the last uh, few months and we've been working on some interesting projects. But, you know, DCS, it's an amazing product and it's brought together a community during a really difficult time. And what's your reflections? Well, I have to say that, um, you know, doing the type of work that I do, which is, you know, with IT and working in a cave, more or less all the time underground. Um, I don't know if I would have been able to really survive the lockdown for four or five months without having the environment of, of putting on a VR headset and leaving the dungeon and going to fly with my friends all over the world, you know, for a couple hours a day to just to leave all of those, the reality of the negative things that are happening in the world behind and just go do that. Um, one of the, the greatest things I've ever done is fly formation and airplanes and to have the, the capability to do it from the comfort of my own dungeon um, with people who I respect and admire really probably saved my life really and many, many other people around the world. It's, it, it's, um, it's a very immersive and, and it's an excellent thing to have at your disposal. And Frank, you've been an aircraft owner um, you're obviously a pilot. Once a pilot, always a pilot, whether you're currently flying or not. That's that's something you're part of that fraternity for life. Um, to be to be part of aviation as a pilot and aircraft owner and to be flying in this flight simulation environment is actually quite a special thing because we do get to interact with others within our industry that we do know and respect. But there's also the this growing community of young people who are quite attracted to flight simulation because they have the ability to do an experience where they can't necessarily at their stage of life in real world aviation. I mean, that it, it is truly a remarkable thing. Well, I, you know, I tell a lot of people, especially um, young kids that are trying it out for the first time, they can get intimidated. You know, they, um, they see what we, we're doing and at the level that we're doing it and they want to get involved and many of them are intimidated by it until you start to tell them, say, listen, you know, it takes time, it takes practice. And I can promise you one thing. If you can do it here, you can do it in the real world. It's very similar. It looks just like it. In many cases, if, with certain equipment, with certain tactical, tactile feedback that's available, um, like sim shakers and, and butt kickers and so forth, um, there isn't even some feel to it. So you can bring a lot of the the, the aviation world, especially in formation flying, down into the sim. And 
what you'll find, and one of our guys, one a good friend of mine now, Ryan Spain, uh, goes by Moto, who started flying with us in DCS in formation, and then went out and did it in the real world. And he's a young guy. And, he and Moto, today, uh, Ryan has actually now just gone out and bought his first aircraft. He bought an airplane. Just and, and, a, and again, we've been watching that experience. Ryan is actually, uh, he became known to many of us within the community, was doing motorcycle vlogging, um, probably pretty typical of that generation in the United States, really harnessing YouTube and communications, bringing that into uh, aviation and into his flight simulation and now taking that out into aviation. I mean, it's a, again, it's just a remarkable thing. Yeah, it's amazing to see some of the talent that's out there, these young kids and how quickly some of them grasp even some very complex things. And they're going to make great pilots in the real world. They're going to make amazing pilots. They're going to go into it. They're going to step into the cockpit and their instructors are going to be like, this is not your first time. There's no way this is your first time doing it. Once they get over the air sense and the, you know, the, the uh, physiological things that come with flying for real that you don't feel in a sim, once they get past that, which doesn't take long, you know, it's just like anything else takes time. Those guys are going to be very impressive. And I, I think um, once that happens and that generation steps forward and they move out of simulation into the real world, into those real cockpits and the, the proficiency is evident. I think, um, I think that's when, when the tide will probably shift, you know, from, from well, the stigma created with it and moving um, to something that's almost required. It's about youth engagement. It's probably a really good time to now throw some questions across to Shane and Nolan. Shane and uh, Nolan are really our, um, our, I guess, our student pilot and our early private pilot. Uh, guys, I'll probably start with Nolan. I mean, you've you've ventured off to get your private pilot's license, and I see some great photographs on your Facebook page of you in uh, the pit special, and uh, clearly the flying that you've done in the flight simulation environment, the time I've had to get to know you and ask questions of you. You love aviation, but there's a cost to do this as a young person, and it's a real barrier. I mean, what are some of your thoughts on young people trying to get into aviation and, and those barriers, uh, in some cases, preventing them? You're right. I think that is the biggest barrier uh, in getting young people into aviation. Um, I was lucky enough to, um, my mom let me pursue this, uh, my, getting my private pilot license, but um, if it wasn't for that, I would have been extremely limited in the amount of flying I could do. Um, I initially had started on flight simulators myself. Um, in fact, when I was 10 years old on uh, flight simulator 2004. And, um, been working, you know, working towards the, the ultimate goal of being a pilot uh, since then. And uh, I really do think that the flight simulation is what um, not only feeds your curiosity about aviation, but it definitely does develop the skills um, needed. And I think I've saved actually quite a bit of money in my flight lessons because of the experience that I've gained. Well, one of the pilots, Nolan, that we fly with uh, is a pilot who goes by the name of Bumblebee and he'll be watching this and he'll know exactly who we're speaking about. But he is a former British Airways 747 captain. He's now flying the A320. Uh, and uh, he, uh, like Frank, is very clear in saying that during COVID, during a time where he and many of his colleagues uh, who were all losing uh, their jobs and being uh, put aside, uh, he ended up inside of the DCS multiplayer environment and became part of our group. Uh, and uh, he tells this wonderful story that he recently got a call to start flying again and got called in by BA to do the simulation session um, to get current. And he said, you know, he came back the day after and he said, guys, you know, jump back in the sim. He said, I felt like my hand skills had never left. He said, I've been flying in DCS for the last several months. He said, I've been flying every night. And he said, I jumped back in that simulator and he said, I felt like I had really never left. And so, it, you know, I believe his instructor had also commented that, you know, his hand skills were still right in there. So it really does have um, a uh, an opportunity to keep people in the game. Shane, you're over in WA, not as far away as Canada, but WA certainly has its aviation challenges right now. And you want to be involved uh, in commercial aviation. I mean, it's, it is a big hurdle to start at the very beginning and self-funding your way through uh, is no easy feat. You've got to work sometimes one, two and three jobs to have that 
available uh, cash. I think you were saying to me the other day that it's it's well over $160 per 30 minutes. I thought it was really weird that you said per 30 minutes because we're so used to aviation being charged out in hourly blocks. Uh, but some of the information you've been given is you can have access for 160 per 30. So it's about $300 an hour plus uh, to learn to fly. I mean, this is not a small hurdle for you to overcome. No, it's, uh, it's definitely the, the biggest hurdle I find with wanting to learn to fly is the uh, costs involved. Um, you've also got the... I, I find for myself it was, um, you know, you, you kind of get intimidated in trying to get into the industry um, when, you know, if you don't have the money, you feel like, like you're not going to be accepted into it. Um, and th that's where simulators really kind of step in. Like it gives you an opportunity to do this and, you know, spend a little bit of money as you get it to, to do real flights. Um, I found the biggest thing for me, my, my first real flight in a Cessna 152, um, the pilot basically sat back and he said, this is great, I don't have to do anything because I already knew the basics. I told you. basics. <laughs> he, he literally, um, he was just sitting there and I said, well, you may as well take my phone and get me some photos. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've had the opportunity to fly around you, uh, Shane, and you certainly have learnt a great deal. Uh, and, and I have to say, I mean, Frank and I have had this conversation and, and I'll bring uh, Chris in at this point in time because, Chris, you and I have also had this conversation that it is, it, it's sometimes incredibly impressive to see the young people that are involved in this space. And, I, you know, there's like, the, the, again, if he's watching, there's a young guy by the name of Bommy uh, who I believe is like a 13-year-old. He was American expat living in Hong Kong, a 13-year-old. And I was being given instruction on how to run the electronic systems on board an AV8 Harrier by a 13-year-old. And he had an absolute handle on how these systems functioned and worked. You know, and I was saying to, to Bumble as well, uh, who's our um, former British Airways 747 captain, I was just like, mate, I am in awe of the fact that these young kids are dedicating themselves to learning all this information and if they're absorbing this information now by the time they do get their start they're well and truly into it i mean striker you've been involved in military flying you've been involved with working with um, civilian jet formation teams you've been actively involved uh, with air shows you've taken i have to say my hat goes off to you because everything in the virtual space around in virtual events and virtual air shows we hear your iconic voice and a little bit later, we're going to be watching a trailer that yet again has your iconic voice in it. I mean, we've had the discussion. Maybe share some of your thoughts on where this digital VR technology is taking youth, what it's enabling them to do, and maybe what you see for the future. Well, thanks, Ben. Uh, you know, uh, passion knows no age when it comes to especially any of the aspirations in the, in the in aviation. We're seeing that uh, with, like you said, the, uh, the youth uh, we're seeing that uh, also with uh, folks that thought that it passed them up, folks that uh, I've run into folks that uh, think, you know what, I just never, it was never going to happen. Next thing you know, we're, we're connecting uh, online and flying. And there's a, like you said, there's a 13-year-old telling a, uh, a an older individual who thought that would never happen to him that uh, uh, how, to, how to work an aircraft and how to fly. And, um, but yes, the the VR and everything is is a current thing that is bringing in uh, the youth. But I would say um, it, it also is generational. Uh, I would say that the current generation is more accepted to this to flight simulation due to the technology. But also this year alone, like you said, uh, it, it definitely kind of forces it, you know many things terribly to to go terrible. Excuse me for like general aviation. But one thing that COVID did do is it shined and, and it, if it did a positive thing, it shined the light on flight simulation as far as, hey, this is a great alternate method and some and in some ways primary method for folks to get into aviation. Well, there's no doubt about it. it it's bringing people, not just young people, it's, being, it's bringing people of all ages. And Mike, I'll come back to you. I mean, if you have a passion for aviation, it's never too late to actually get involved. And now with this this technology available on a home PC, I mean, you can buy a home PC now for 
a couple of thousand dollars that will adequately run this uh, software and give you such a great experience. I mean, really, people shouldn't miss out on becoming involved in aviation when this stuff is so accessible. Oh, you're exactly right there, Ben. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, a lot of my mates have been forced to retire uh, just as a result of the uh, of, of the virus um, of them becoming involved in this because it's actually uh, as I said I'm involved in the Russian Roulette's uh, team um, we haven't had a had a show now for over a year and unlikely to have one until uh, next year if uh, if all goes well um, we do have a member of uh, the team who's actually involved with DCS as a programmer um, and uh, I'm looking forward to actually getting the rest of the guys involved and say this is actually a great way to practice this is and they're all my age they're all uh, my age or around, around about my age um, and just getting them around to that idea I think uh, look it's going to be hard it, uh, Chris is exactly right it's a gen generational thing but uh, the advantages are definitely there. The the uh, the aircraft are actually model. They uh, we've got two guys who fly the Yak fifty two, and uh, I fly the Nanchang, and the rest of all the Nanchangs. But uh, to get together on uh, on DCS, fly the Yak fifty two, um, using uh, the uh, the same routines that the team uses, I think would be very easy and, and a fantastic way to practice. Yeah. So yeah. You mentioned something really interesting there that um, you, with your work, and uh, not the work, but your pursuit of forma formation display team flying in the civilian world. Um, Striker has a, uh, Striker is Chris Curtis, I have to apologise. Uh, Chris has a very interesting story here, and that is, Chris, uh, you did some work with the Patriots jet display team, a civilian L-39 uh, jet display team, and we had, a, we had an opportunity to have a bit of a catch-up about this, and you were explaining that when these L-39 jet teams want to work up a show, it can involve tens of thousands of dollars worth of costs, many tens of thousands of dollars worth of costs, not only to put the fuel in the tanks for these teams to go out and practice these routines, but the maintenance hours, the ground crew time, and all the engineering. And so you and the team came up with a, a novel approach to putting together a new show with a, with a, the aim of saving them a considerable amount of time so that they would not have to go back to sponsors and put a further burden on them. Maybe share with us some of those thoughts. That's right. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was a few years back, the Patriots jet team, they're a private jet team on the West Coast. They were, at the time, I believe this was 2010, they were uh, trying to transition for uh, from a four-ship Era jet team to a six ship jet team, which is not just adding two more or 50%. It's an exponential challenge uh, on many levels. Like you said, they're not the Thunderbirds. They're not the Blue Angels. They don't have unlimited government resources to go up in the, in the you know, two, two sorties a day, every day. And uh, so, yes, there was a financial challenge to them. And I happen to know them through some buddies of mine that flew in the military. And uh, they actually, we got together, we talked to, hey, look, you know, you fly this online flight simulator. Uh, can you put an L-39 in there and crank out some, uh, some ideas for our, our routine? Because, our, we're, again, we're going from four to six jets. And I said, absolutely. And uh, so the virtual Patriots uh, all of a sudden just got incorporated to the real Patriots jet team for this uh, unique challenge. And we uh, were able to present uh in this manner a solution to them and just multi-levels uh from from inside the cockpit outside the cockpit uh uh camera views and angles from the crowd uh things that you've never even seen or, or and it basically cut the time uh significantly for them and also actually found we found some safeties we found some safety concerns so we alleviated through the virtual flying and uh i believe there's at least a maneuver or two that was uh rewritten uh, from my input alone, not to mention a few of the others, they're, they're, they're still flying to this day. So we have a great relationship with them. Uh, Patriots are very uh, close to me as because uh, I also did an announcing for them for four years. Well, we saw uh, some news not long ago that was published via um, uh, one of the DCS groups on Facebook, uh, which was that the US military are actually using this very technology today. And in fact, Eagle Dynamics, which developed the DCS product, 
uh, have two sides to their operations. They have the consumer side, which is the civilian world can download a copy of their flight simulation package, and you can get that from www.digitalcombatsimulator.com. It's completely free to download, and you do get some free aircraft when you initially download it, but then as you add aircraft on, they're on a paid basis. But they develop a con this consumer product for the civilian market, but then a very large side of their organisation is they develop military systems. They have a military version uh, of that DCS product where they have ultra high fidelity uh, in those models. And I think it, it, if I've got my history correct, and uh, the DCS world, I'll apologize up front if I get it wrong, but it really kind of started around the A-10 for them. Have I got that right, Frank? No, I started back with the SU-27, like about 1990 or so. And I have that, and actually. They, I have actually, I think Bumble was telling me something about that, but they've moved on and they developed an A-10 product for the military uh, and they, they have like a combat um, arena in which the pilots can participate with weapons and all the rest of it. So this stuff is being used. We also know that with much of the development around drones and UAVs and ARP, as we call them in Australia, the, the military are using VR technology, headset te technology, and the much, you know, many of the flight control systems that consumers can now buy for their own flight simulation rigs, the US military themselves uh, use on, on their products. So it is, you know, we're finally getting to a point where the hardware and the software is, is really at a level where the fidelity and the accuracy is really starting to get there. Now, we've just briefly touched on uh, a, a subject here, which is part of what I see as the real youth attraction in this space. And that is for the experience, those that have gained experience within the digital combat simulation, simulation environment, teams have been formed. So it's not just individuals that are flying around in this flight simulation environment. We now have highly organized and highly trained teams flying team jet aerobatics. I mean, who would have ever thought that this would become a thing? Uh, but Frank, you're right at the centre of this. And in fact, we've discovered in the lead up to this interview today that there's actually a connection here in that there is this team called the Virtual Thunderbirds. So a virtual representation of the US Air Force Thunderbirds air show display team. And in fact, not only yourself, Frank, were involved in this, but Mike is one of the original uh, virtual Thunderbirds, and Chris himself is also part of that. True. Yeah, it was just happenstance. You didn't realize that when you put the panel together, but yeah, three of us. Are, I'm still with the team now, and the other two, uh, Mike and Chris, uh, they founded it, along with some others, about 15 years ago. Well, 16 years now. Amazing. It's a, it, we, we made the comment earlier that how small is the world today, and even smaller uh, with COVID-19 now pushing us into this digital space and that we're also connected. I mean, Mike, you, you, you're one of, you, you mentioned it before, you said you're a Thunderbird alumni. I mean, how awesome to have been part of that uh, at the time that you were and the fact that it is still going today, uh, stronger than it has ever been and doing some amazing stuff in that digital space. It's amazing, yeah. Uh, the virtual Thunderbirds, uh, the virtual Blue Angels are the two, the two, two best teams, there's no, no I think the uh, VRA would have something to say about that. Well, yeah, but, well they were. <laughs> a few others. Were. I remember when I first uh, tried out for them, uh, Chris was, uh, it was, it was in the team at that stage, and the guys just blew me away. They really did. They, uh, they, I was there in the slot, and um, guys all joined up, and I go, oh, my God, these guys are doing it the way it's supposed to be done. And there was, a, uh, of course, a, a bit of a military background with some, with some, some of the guys, but... Uh, the professionalism that they showed, um, the the work ethic they showed, it was just very compelling. They still do it today, so it's they're they're great teams. And uh, uh, I said my, my heart will always be with the VTB. But um, well, I'm going to come. I'm going to throw some questions at Frank about this because I'd like him to tell uh, our members and industry supporters a little bit more about this. But before I ask those questions of Frank, I want to throw this out to our two young members that are here today. I mean. What kind of inspiration does it provide you when you log into this virtual environment and you're sitting on an airfield? And it's very difficult for maybe those that are watching this video to understand, but when you're wearing a VR helmet and you're sitting in the aircraft, you genuinely feel like you're sitting in that aeroplane with the canopy slid back and you're watching uh, Frank and Chris and all these guys come in in this big multi-ship jet airshow formation display team and they do a show 
I mean, it it's like being there in the real world, but it is really inspirational. How do you guys, how does it make you feel and how does it inspire you to want to continue to fly? We'll start with Nolan, throw it to the bottom and we'll go to, to Shane next. Uh, yeah, I definitely think it's, it's definitely inspirational. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I remember the first time seeing uh, something like that, like I said, sitting on the ramp with your VR goggles on and it's like you're sitting there at an air show, but even better, you're sitting in your, your own airplane of choice and um, I just couldn't help but, but think I, I, I need to learn how to do this. Like, how do I, how can I do this? And, and uh, you know, a couple of years later or uh, around that and uh, here we are, Ben, you and I have made our own little uh, air show display routine up. And, I was just about to say that. I mean, you've 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 honed your skills inside of DCS, and you and I have been uh, doing some flying with some F eighty six Sabre jets uh, with the two ship team, and I can tell you that that has been extremely complicated to learn how to do it and to do it to us to a high standard. Uh, I look at what Frank and his guys do, and I just think I, I don't understand how they can do it. That the the discipline and the training that is required to fly to that standard is just second to none so it, it is a huge amount of work and shane obviously you're in the same boat you've been training uh with the formation group that we've been flying with and you've been really making a commitment in that space when you see frank and the boys fly what does it make you think oh uh, it's it just put, puts you back in your seat really like i remember um you know i've been flying in dcs which was originally lock on um with some international friends for you know over 10 years and it wasn't until i started uh, interacting with all these guys that I started kind of understanding what it actually takes to fly in that that level of formation um, you, you kind of sit there and you, you have to kind of second guess it like is that actually people doing it or is that like a, a render or something like that because and Shane, that, that's that a very interesting in... point I'll, I'll just stress I'm going to labor on this a little bit um, the guys uh, the Riat, they did the virtual Riat. Uh, I think if I've got it correct uh, not long ago because they could not run the actual air show in the UK due to COVID. They did a virtual air show. And those that were on YouTube were putting comments up saying, oh, it's like a computer rendering. It's like a movie. That's actually not the case. I mean, these aircraft, although when you watch it as a video replay, you see a simulated airplane. The fact is there is absolutely no computer flying it. It is the human that's providing the input. And what you're seeing is their accuracy and their fidelity is the human interface. It, it's it's not a recording. It's not like a 3D movie that's made by Disney, is it? No, that's that's right. And a lot of people would see it from an external point of view, but it's it's when you see from in the cockpit how much work it takes to hold that formation that you really start respecting what they do. Okay, now I've got... A short, I'm going to play a short section of the Virtual Thunderbirds promotion video. We're not going to be able to play it all just because we're limited on time. I'm going to play a little bit of it and it's going to give you a bit of an idea of the people behind it and I guess give you a bit of a, a feel. And then, Frank, we're going to come to you and we're going to talk a little bit about the Virtual Thunderbirds. We've got four unwritten rules. Fly good. Don't suck. Show up. Don't be a guy. Corey Butsky Prefontaine from Edmonton, Canada. I've been into Sims for as long as I can remember, ever since way back on the old Amiga flying F-18 Interceptor. We didn't have a Thrustmaster sticks back then, an old Atari stick was, was all you could get. Rick Charles, uh, call sign Ray, uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, currently live in Las Vegas, Nevada, home of the Thunderbirds. <laughs> able to be more precise with a, with a good stick and throttle. And that's where, you know, with us uh, and Thrustmaster, they provided the, the best game controllers out there for us to do our, our uh, demo with. You know, they're very precise. They use the hall sensors. Um, you can really make a lot of fine inputs that you couldn't make with some of the other controllers that have a different type of gimbal system in there. And we were flying. Okay. I'd love to let that play through to the end. I'm just going to be conscious of our time. I mean, there's a few things we saw there. Number one, those visuals of all the jets doing their business, that was the 
that's not the real Thunderbirds. I mean, you could be really confused there. I mean, it looks like the real Thunderbirds, but they are in fact you and your team flying in the virtual space. And to, to also maybe Frank touch on the fact that the virtual Thunderbirds are also supported by Thrustmaster. Correct. And Thrustmaster is you know synonymous with the world of simulation, some of the best joystick hardware that, uh, that you can get. Uh, and also maybe some discussion around the fact that the virtual Thunderbirds is not a simulation it's a group of people. It's a, a really diverse group of guys yeah, from various you, aviation backgrounds. You touched on something there. I, I want to actually go back a little. The uh, one thing about VR, virtual reality, that I think gets completely missed by people that haven't used it is um, when you're wearing them, you have stereoscopic vision. You have, you have depth perception. And that's something that nobody understands and you can't explain it to them until they see it for themselves. So it's not just like you're putting a flat screen on your face and looking around and striking your vision. You see things with depth. You see how close you are to a wingtip and so forth. So I just wanted to add that. And as far as the uh, the team goes, and it's a, it's a saying you touched on it that I use all the time. And I say the flying is a simulation, but the teamwork, it's not. And that's, that's one of the things that really makes it so immersive is working with a group of guys that just pour so much effort and professional into professionalism into what they're doing to achieve a common goal. And when the end result comes and we're striving to get better, and even when we have a successful uh, performance, it feels really great to, uh, to experience that. And, um, you know, that, that is probably what keeps me doing it in the team environment is working with so many great people all the time. And the guys that you have involved with the team, and they're not just aviators. Some of them have different backgrounds from aviation, but have a real passion for aviation as well. Yeah, I would say most of the, well, two of them that are currently here are professional aviators. And virtually, the re just about all of the rest of us are, are aviators in one way or another. But um, the professional career paths are, are different. Mine is, um, you know, mine's in IT and, and so forth. In fact, a few of us are. Um, but it's just a passion, the general passion for aviation in general that, that brings us here together. And Frank, what we see globally around multiplayer gaming is that it has evolved quite considerably in the last 10 years. And in many respects, it's now become so profile that there are esports tournaments and very large a very large global corporate focus on promoting and celebrating the fact that there are millions of youth around the world hundreds of millions probably uh, that are have become involved in playing online games and money has poured in and we now see huge tournaments in the US we see huge tournaments in Asia um, and in Europe I mean, flight simulation is really one of those last uh, areas of gaming which is now starting to evolve. And with virtual air shows and, and team flying, I mean, we're on the cusp of watching much of this starting to, you know, burst into the mainstream. You know, it's interesting. The um, I would love to see an eSport in what we're doing, but, and I really, not to detract from some of those things. My, my son's a maniac gamer He's in some of the games he plays, uh, mostly first person shooters. This is much more difficult. And I think that's one of the things that keeps it from being a mainstream event. People don't know what they're looking at. They're not really familiar with the nuances of um, combat, air combat in, in a simulation and um, team flying. They, they don't really know what they're seeing. So then then when they go try it, there's they're looking for that you know, quick instant gratification and they recognize that, wow, this is going to take a lot of work just to become just somewhat proficient. So I think um, it'll be a long time. And, uh, but I do hope, um, I do hope people recognize the skills and talents that are out here doing this. So Chris, uh, one of the areas that has started to uh, come together over the past six months was a launch of a community effort led by uh, one of the community gamers by the name of uh, Grinelli. And Grinelli and his team put together a uh, simulated Edge 540, and they've created a whole stack of air racing events for the community. I mean, this this is, I mean, what um, Frank is saying is quite correct, and that is in, in the world of team formation aerobatics, 
and flying, it might be a little bit harder to get that going as an e-sport. But with uh, virtual air racing, um, pylon racing and, and uh, sport racing that Grinelli and the community have developed, this is certainly an area that young people can get involved in and they can get that instant gratification punch of scoring the lowest time and being the fastest around the track. That's right, Ben. Excuse me. So flight simulation today really kind of has its fingers in all aspects. Uh, if you want to go down the technical path, uh, if you want to go down the instant gratification with with uh, barreling down over you know a water course at like two feet around pylons uh, with incredible roll rates uh, and, a, and a hugely competitive field, uh, this is just an amazing avenue that flight sim really really thrives in. And uh, we've got a great community. The community continues to uh, just expand as a whole. But yeah, I think we're on the cusp of something very uh, very huge. I think we're just waiting for that match to actually strike, and it's going to strike. We just don't know exactly when. Well, we certainly have come together through this, as has many thousands of others right around the world, and we've been working on a unique project ourselves. So we, we've we kind of come into this mixing pot of virtual pilots. We, Although we're pilots in the real world, we call ourselves virtual pilots in the digital space. Uh, and as virtual pilots, many of us have been volunteering behind the scenes at night beavering away to try and create events and activities to encourage young people to participate because part a big part of what we see with youth engagement, Mike, uh, is the mentoring, making sure that young people, if they're going to be participating, are surrounded by mentors, people within the industry that have experience and can help guide them uh, towards taking the right, the right first steps and also encouraging them once they take those first steps towards flight training to keep it going until they get that license. Look, it's uh, mentorship is a very important part of the scene. I'm, I'm personally involved with about three uh, private pilots uh, working their way up um, in the in the real world. But uh, this way, um, you do lower the costs. Um, the, the, the barriers to entry there are much uh, lower than say if someone wanted to go straight into uh, private flying and working their way up uh, to eventually join an airline or something like that so it's a huge thing so i look um i be, being a mentor is very fulfilling for me um and if there's people out there who would like to become involved in that sort of thing i can highly rec recommend it um i've got a lot of um experience um a lot of things that people don't think about when they when they actually join or they try to get involved in the uh, aviation scene whether real or um, virtual um, so the, if, if the guys around with my age or don't have to be my age uh, who have something to give back um, it's a truly worthwhile thing um, it's, it's one of the most fulfilling things that I, I do and to get involved in it from uh, the virtual um, Point of view would be just the icing on the cake as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's a wonderful thing to be able to log in at night time and give up an hour of your time or two hours of your time uh, every other night uh, to jump in the virtual environment and to do some flying. And, you know, I find it particularly rewarding when I jump in and I catch up with Nolan and Shane and a few of the other young guys. You know, Jeannie, who's been starting his aviation maintenance career, we've got a young guy in the UK by the name of Broadsword. Every time we jump in, Brody. Uh, is typically there doing an online training course towards his engineering qualifications. Uh, Nolan always giving us a bit of a rundown of what the latest uh, experience he's had and lessons that he might be taking. And, and again, with Shane, and Shane's a great example that we've been able to connect Shane since we've gotten to know him with uh, Tony White, who's the president of the Australian Sport Aircraft Association. And Shane will be shortly catching up with Tony in WA to start taking some flights with uh, sport aircraft owners and to potentially get involved in helping build some aeroplanes as he progresses through his flight training. So this digital world is a gateway to the real world of aviation. And so our community has come together and I've brought AOPA to the table in respect of this because I think it's very important that we use all of the mediums that are currently available to us to bring as many people into aviation and to also bring as many people uh, from within the flight simulation world into real world aviation. You know, we speak often about the challenge of getting general aviation thriving. How do we get 
thousands of people wanting to own aircraft? How do we get thousands of people wanting to uh, take up a private license and to do a little bit of private flying each year? And I think that this is a great catalyst. So having said that, we've got this group that we call Virtual Pilot. And Frank, we've been working on something pretty special. We've, we've put together a virtual air show as a way of showcasing what this community is about and the flying that we can do in the virtual world and, they, and the people you will meet through the virtual world. And on the 26th of September at uh, 2000 hours UTC, we intend on delivering this virtual event, which will run for about three, possibly four hours if it gets, uh, it gets a bit long in the tooth. But it's, it's a fully multidimensional air show environment that has been set up with custom assets. And Shane, you've played a role in designing custom assets, air show stands and speaker stands and uh, advertising billboards in this virtual space. And Nolan's involved in training as part of a two-ship uh, F-86 Sabre Synchro Pair Air Show uh, presentation. And Frank, you're going to be doing the digital broadcast for this event, and that's a huge undertaking. And Chris, you'll be doing the air show calling uh, and I'm, I imagine you'll also be interviewing, we've got a few industry leaders and uh, companies lined up to have a conversation during that event. So this is going to be a really interesting exercise in showcasing to the world what this is all about. Frank, you maybe want to tell us a little bit about what's involved in putting something like this together? Yeah, sure. And plus um, something else about it, because um, we were talking about the immersion factor. We're doing this, virtual air shows isn't anything that's new, but the way we're doing it right now, um, it hasn't been done like like this much in uh, recent years. And what that means is we're putting, we're using air traffic controllers, we're using an Airbus, we have um, hold points and we have a aerobatic box and all these different um, pieces and parts that you would use and experience at a real air show, including when performers join their airplane and they start up and they, they taxi and they're holding short while other performers are flying in that same space. So multiple cameras located all around and behind uh, the, uh, the show scene on, in, in a, a floating blimp. You know, all these things are happening to bring a completely immersive virtual air show ex experience. So um, that, there are some challenges to that. You know, um, there's a lot more going on in the, in the production area where we're not taking um, individual performances packaged up and, and like beamed out to the um, to a single control booth. It's all happening at show center with myself and Stryker and Moto, um, David, um, Mug, um, and a few, well, a few others. It's hard for me to say, um, I, I say uh, so, nicknames. Get so used to using people's call signs. <laughs> so, using people's call signs. so this event's uh, special that way. And I think it brings, brings a whole different feel to it. And the immersive, feelings that people should get from being part of it, hopefully we'll bring them to the real world and do the same things down the road. So, well, we, um, uh, I say we, but you have prepared a video uh, trailer uh, of what people can expect to see as part of this virtual air show. It runs for a few minutes, uh, but it'll give everyone a bit of a sense as to what we're trying to achieve with this. So, what we might do is we might just run the trailer through and then we can have a little bit of a chat about it and uh, and then we can wrap up for the day. But uh, here we go. Let's have a look. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Chris Stryker Curtis. Since the achievement of aerial flight on that fateful day at Kitty Hawk, we have never stopped in pushing the limits of aviation. In this pursuit, we have met and conquered many barriers that still remain in this challenge of man flight. Now, with the advent of the computer and internet, we have united across the world in this pursuit of its pixelated counterpart of flying the better day. Sponsored by Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association of Australia. Witness aerial perfection as we push the virtual envelope of aerial flight to give the virtual airspace over to the best of the best at Thunder over Kutasi. For over 
over 15 years, the virtual aviation community has evolved to a truly remarkable and realistic display of virtual flight never before imagined. At Thunder Over Kutasi, you'll witness demonstrations of classic and real-world aircraft, as well as new and exciting maneuvers never before seen to include a special tribute to Mike Kiko Chavez, who passed due to complications from muscular dystrophy. This event features a full acrobatic box and staff to boot air bots, air traffic controllers, and air show rules and parameters, just like you see in our real events. virtual pilot and established flight simulation community of over 400 members and growing is now proud to announce an event containing over 10 solo acts and four teams so mark your calendars for the 26th of september starting at 2000 gmt as we give you thunder over kutasi All right, that's a fantastic trailer that you put together there, mate. That uh, was uh, pretty inspiring. That was the intent. Trying to do, um, trying to do it in slow motion to uh, to tell a story. There's a lot of nuances that you you just can't see any other way. So, um, actually, it was inspired by the when you saw the AOPA logo, you noticed the uh, the team that was splitting. That's Aerovector, and it's led by a kid named JJ Kirby, seventeen year old kid who's just hell bent right now to joining the Royal Air Force and uh, becoming a pilot there. And I know a future red arrow. I in know the he'll get there. And so he actually it inspired me to, to, um, to build that trailer in that style. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, it was really a lot of fun to do. I enjoyed that very much. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it that uh, there's just an enormous body of talent that sits within this space. I mean, Mike, what do you think when you see that trailer? I was about to say I feel like applauding. <laughs> it's, it was uh, so well done, uh, both the flying and the uh, production oh, of, uh, itself. It was actually very, um, very motivating to get uh, to get back into this sort of thing. So AOPA Australia uh, has made a bit of a commitment in this space and we, we really think and we feel that this, this technology is the future. This is where young people are going to be first making their connection with aviation as we, we go further forward in time and as computer hardware gets much faster. I notice NVIDIA this week have announced new graphics cards which are going to take flight simulation graphics again in another quantum leap forward. Uh, and I think the uh, the Radeon cards are, are due to be announced as well. We're now, you know, the, the CPU processes are, are starting to push uh, their limits as well. And we're seeing some great competition between Intel and AMD, which is pushing um, performance even higher and higher. And so there is, there's just absolutely no doubt that in the next 12 months to two years, we're going to see some phenomenal um, uh, advances in that in that software. We're already seeing that with Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 that has broken onto the scene and has introduced a whole new standard regarding the graphics and the, the visual experience. I think they've still got a little bit of work to go on their flight modeling and some other aspects, but you know, that, you know, that product will develop with time. So we see there's a real value in this. And what I would like to see uh, is that as, an, as a global industry, 
And I think that this is a real opportunity for AOPA as a global brand all around the world, whether it be AOPA in the United States, whether it be AOPA in Europe or the UK or Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, we as a global community of, of aviation leadership need to be getting behind this stuff and seeing to it that we create a platform where young people can express their passion for aviation, where experienced aviators can participate in mentoring and helping uh, encourage those young people and where the, the we'll call them the periphery crea uh, creative talents, guys like Frank who have uh, you know, great IT skills to produce great videos uh, and, you know, guys like Chris who do great voiceover, combining all of these people from across the global industry to create content that can be very, very powerful and inspiring uh, young people and, and old people alike, anyone of any age group to get involved in aviation. And, and that to me is the real, the real excitement that I see in this is that we are here right now on this panel of six we are Australia, we're the United States, we're Canada. I know Bumble was wanting to join us. He's from the UK and David uh, was wanting to join us from the UK as well, but unfortunately they're, they're, they're unavailable. But we as a global community volunteering can produce content that can help inspire thousands of young people to get involved. And I just think that's a wonderful thing. Chris? Yeah, so uh, whether you like it or not, the flight sim world is a global community already and has been for many years so it really just is the perfect marriage and fit to take that uh, and be accepted in especially uh you know aopa whether it's australia or the globe so it, it is already there in essence it just needs to be in my opinion um exactly what you're doing ben is just tapping into that and uh, and really kind of bringing your arms in a sense around it because it's already there well, we do this with the drones. You know, AOPA led the charge in the United States in saying we want drone pilots to be part of the aviation industry. We don't want drone pilots to feel that they're not pilots and that they're not part of aviation. And so they created uh, the AOPA membership for drones to bring them in. And I, I really genuinely believe we need to be doing the same in this virtual space. We need to be creating uh, membership opportunities. Uh, for young people to to be part in that virtual sense. And if we can have thir 12 and 13, and um, we've seen them, uh, Frank, the 12 and 13-year-olds inside of uh, DCS flying aircraft, just, you know, and you and I sit there talking, going, have you seen what this guy's flying? Like, this is incredible, 12-year-old, right? If we can be inspiring those guys and we can be putting them with guys like Mike and other aviators who can who can nurture that interest. And I think it also gives parents as well I think parents also can have some comfort in knowing that instead of having young guys and girls involved in online gaming where they can actually be involved in environments where it gets a little bit rowdy and out of control, um, obviously it still does it to a degree in the multiplayer sense with aviation. We're no different. Um, but to know that there's a community of mentorship of people who really value this experience and want to, want to cultivate uh, participation, that's a great thing. So uh, let's go around the room with some last thoughts and comments about how uh, this technology uh, can bring young people into aviation and maybe just uh, some comments that you might have or thoughts that you might have on uh, the virtual space and also this upcoming uh, virtual air show. We might start with Shane. I'm going to put him right on the spot and you can see his face saying, don't pick me first. <laughs> What's your thought, Shane? Uh, <clears throat> I th <clears throat> excuse me. I think it's definitely the way into the industry, especially for young people. Um, I mean, I myself started on, you'd probably remember the first joystick that I was using. It was handcrafted, almost uh, had a CV boot from a car to hold it together. Um, my computer was scraps from the, the junkyard. Um, so, you, I mean, you can download the simulator for free. You can download mods. Um, there's really not a lot stopping people. And as long as, as you've got power, you can really get into it and you know, meeting all you guys has just opened up the world for me. Um, the knowledge that I've got from it, um, and not not only in flight simulation, like it's it's opened up IT and uh, 3D design and all that. Um, so it's it's a really big world, and it's got a lot of possibilities. Nolan, let's jump to you. Yeah, I think uh, we hit the nail on the head when we talked about ease of accessibility. Um, a lot of things with aviation are just inherently expensive. Uh, it's not cheap to run airplanes. 
and it's certainly not cheap to run flight schools. And um, even, for example, an air show, if you want to get to an air show, it's going to cost you money in transport and the ticket. Whereas with this platform, it's totally free to download. Anyone can do it. Anyone can get into it. And um, it, it, it'll spark the, a curiosity that, uh, in my case, has lasted well, we'll hopefully last and Nolan, time. you're going to be flying in the Thunder Over Katazi live stream virtual air show event. You're flying as a virtual Golden Hawk F-86 Sabre, uh, and I'll be joining you for that. So you and I will be doing our two-ship routine. I've got to be honest with you. This is not something I ever imagined in my lifetime that I would be participating in uh, to, to fly in a virtual air show. Uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun, and I, you know, I thank you for putting in all the effort over the last few months uh, for the training. I mean, not a lot of people would realise, you know, we we would be up at like last night. You know, it's nearly one o'clock in the morning, and we're doing training sessions, trying to iron out the uh, the presentation. Because again, when you're flying a presentation in front of Frank, lead pilot and uh, extraordinaire for the virtual Thunderbirds, there's a little bit of pressure on, isn't there? Oh, stop, stop it. We we won't come close. To meeting those standards <laughs> this show anyways but um yeah it's definitely been fun uh practicing and just ironing out the details of it and stuff and uh, looking forward great stuff to, uh, more chris what's your final thoughts you know i always say this that the flight sim community conquered social distancing before it was mainstream yes uh, it is one of the few <laughs> things that has uh, benefited greatly from that not that it is uh covid was a, is a good thing because it's not but it's brought it it will continue to bring uh uh under current measures this community together it's a great opportunity for everybody if you if you're wondering what to do uh hop online at uh, discord mug a virtual pilot and uh enjoy and just see how great this community is uh and, and the doors it'll open for you absolutely mike what's your final thoughts on all of this the whole uh, scene has been building probably for 15 to 20 years. And I think what has been missing is an overarching organisation such as AOPA to actually bring it all uh, to, um, to, uh, together. And I think this is this is a great idea, actually, Ben. It really is. It's, uh, it's something that uh, is required. It's, we've had a lot of... Um, Groups that have uh, tried to lead, uh, you know, the VFAT organisation, uh, various teams that have have grown up, but it does need something a little bit more standardised, a little bit more um, uh, omnipresent, I guess. Um, just one organisation. So I'm f fully behind this. I think AFPA are trying to take a lead in this, um, and and to get it all all together with all the themes you've discussed is actually a fantastic idea, and uh, I commend you for it. Frank, the final well, not word much, or, the, or, the final, or the final hour. There's not much to say not, that hasn't been said already, except for this. Nolan, flying with Ben, you'll never have to prove your courage in any other way. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that true? Ain't that true? <laughs> the, poor, the poor bugger. <laughs> well, uh, I'd like to thank you all for making some time. Um, we're going to be doing a little bit more of this. This is uh, this is not a one-off. This is the start of something truly unique. And, you know, I, I kind of reflect back on Mike's comments, and I think you are right, Mike. I think that this is a space that needs organisational leadership, and I think that AOPA globally is really well-placed to be doing it. I think that if you're going to have an organisation uh, being involved in flight simulation with a view of encouraging youth into the industry, then we need to marry up to flight simulation an organisation that has a genuine and strong vested interest into ensuring that those youth get a really good experience and that they are as best prepared as we can possibly um, provide to ensure that when they do move across into real world aviation, they've got the best fighting chance. And I, you know, I see it. I absolutely see it. You know, the time that I've spent online with uh, Frank and his team, uh, Moto and the rest of the the virtual pilot crowd, I think we're 456 strong as of uh, today. And we'd definitely like to see more people take part. And I think uh, for anyone uh, that is keenly interested in participating in this space, uh, we'll put some links at the bottom of the video that you can actually contact us on uh, the Discord 
the Discord. That's kind of like, oh, the Discord. Anyway, you can contact us on our uh, communication software, which is called Discord. We'll also put some links in there for the website uh, and links are where you can download the software. And of course, to any of our members and industry supporters, if you want to know how to get a computer set up so that you can get started in this space, do not hesitate. Just reach out, send us a message on Facebook or send us an email through to the AOPA email address is mail at aopa.com.au. And we'll see to it that someone reaches out and contacts you and helps guide you through because it is a truly rewarding experience and one in which you'll build friendships. I'm really uh, pleased of the friendships that I've made now around the world. I never would have imagined I would have ever had the pleasure and opportunity to meet any of you. Uh, and yet COVID-19, one of the most difficult and painful periods for aviation that our global community has ever faced gave us that. And I think that it has started something truly remarkable and we've got everything to gain from continuing to work. So I look forward to seeing you all for Thunder Over Katazi, the live stream uh, virtual air show event. I welcome the entire AOPA community here in Australia and around the world uh, to participate. We'll be sending links and posting uh, more of those trailers on the formal AOPA pages in the days to come. And hopefully we'll see more and more pilots get into this space because we've got a lot of work to do in getting more young people into aviation. Thank you all and appreciate your time. And uh, thank you again to our listeners and, uh, and viewers. And we'll see you all again later in the week. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>